This summer we've been doing a uh, comprehensive detox as a church. The purpose hasn't been to lose weight or boost energy, although it may result in that. The goal has been to get closer to God and get these toxins out of our souls that have a way of settling there. We've connected with God through creation and silence and solitude. We've found God through the written words of scripture and song. Last week, we considered how even sleep can become the spiritual discipline. And today, we're looking at the discipline of sobriety to conclude our series. You probably didn't think of sobriety as a spiritual discipline. But the irony of sobriety is that the greatest freedom, the freedom that you were created for, is only found when you're sober, as we'll see today. God, wow, what a morning. Thank you for Jenny's testimony. God, thank you that you've come to give us life and life to the full, and I thank you that you're doing it right now. You're the God of acceleration. And so we pray that in the minutes we have remaining, that you would speak razor sharp truth that would come into our souls and would change us forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, a few years ago, I, uh, I learned a valuable lesson about gas. I went out one morning to start my chainsaw and I couldn't get that thing started. Is there anything more frustrating than trying to start a dead chainsaw? If you know, you know. There is one thing more aggravating, just one, a string trimmer. <laughs> trying to start a string trimmer that will not start is the absolute worst and I discovered that on the same day. After a few hundred pulls and a nearly torn rotator cuff, I gave up. The next week, it was my lawnmower. Mechanically challenged as I am, I took all three to Fred, this small engine guy who gave me a valuable lesson. It only costs you $85 an hour. And Fred explained to me how the added ethanol in the gas gums up a small engine carburetor while it sits there over winter. Initially, it's no big deal, but over time, that cheap fuel additive becomes like glue, and if you don't deal with it, it will gum up your engine and make you say bad words, too, probably. I don't know, just from experience, but, you know. <laughs> Ethanol is like sin. It's an additive... Or right, let's talk, let's, let's get away from ethanol. I know that we have some corn farmers in here. Let's talk specifically about sin. <laughs> sin is an additive that pollutes what's pure. It doesn't seem like a big deal at first. It's not causing any problems until you use it over and over and over until it takes over and then it starts using you. And this is what leads to all the problems in the world, including addiction. Addiction that gums up our lives, clogs our souls, slows us down, holds us back. Addictions that hurt those around us, hurt our relationships with God. By the way, we didn't ask Jenny to get baptized this morning because she has a story about addiction. That's just the way God works. Right. Sobriety is the alternative to addiction. Sobriety has two main meanings. The first is to be serious, dignified, and deeply sincere. The second meaning is to be free, free from intoxication, free from the influence of a substance, free from addiction. We often associate addiction with illicit drug use or alcohol abuse, but we can get addicted to anything. Camino Recovery defines the 10 most common addictions of our time as coffee, nicotine, alcohol, sex, illegal and prescription drugs, gambling, technology, especially phone and computer use, video games, it's interesting, that has a category in and of itself, food, and work. Notice how good, even necessary, most of those things are. 
It's the misuse and the abuse of the good that results in all kinds of problems. Now, we can become intoxicated with any of those, actually with anything which results in our being out of control. But freedom is only found in being in control. And that is where you get to enjoy what Paul calls the soundness of mind. Sobriety is a discipline because it requires saying no to the things you want and yes to the things you need, even if you don't want them. It's an act of the will, and it's a discipline because it doesn't come easy. So think about yourself. What is it that you struggle with? Gone are the days where we would stand up here and say, some of you are dealing with addiction. Think about that for a minute. What is the one thing you're finding hard to limit, to manage, or control? There's probably several, but what's one thing? Can you admit it? Jenny is the bravest person on the stage this morning so far. The good news is that your sanctification, your being made more and more into the likeness of Christ, is worked out in part as you overcome that thing. There's no wasted time in this. This could even, you could say, be a gift. The tools and the truth you learn through this recovery, so to speak, become the very things you give others, just like Jenny did for us. The apostle Peter, the once wild and out of control Peter who became essentially the first pope, told the Christians of his day, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He's not nice. He doesn't care about you. He wants to eat you and ruin you. Paul means here that, or Peter means here that you've got to stay clear headed to stay clear of the enemy. King Solomon wrote, A man without self control is like a city without walls. That's no small thing coming from a king who all he cared about was protection and walls. The Apostle Paul told the people of Galatia that self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. It's the evidence of the Spirit's work. When you see self-control, when you see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, when you see those things in somebody, you can say, ah, must be the Spirit working in that person. They are things we are to pursue and to practice. Paul told the people of Ephesus, a city known for its drinking parties, maybe like Vegas, do not get drunk with wine. Do not, don't fill yourself with wine, but rather be filled. With, don't, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, wasteful living, but rather be filled with the Spirit. Invite God to fill you so full, there's not this huge void that you have to fill with everything else. This, this space, this Void, by the way, that is the real cause of addiction. Nobody wakes up and they're like, I think I'll get addicted to some things today. We develop these chronic habits of filling ourselves to cover and compensate for pain, for disappointment, for offense, even just for boredom. That's what it was for me. And we develop these coping mechanisms that only make things worse. Paul's letter to the people of Corinth is particularly helpful on this. Paul says, look, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you all were. But you, if you're a Christian, you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I have the right to do anything, you say. But not everything is beneficial. You see, the people had this new freedom at this point. Is that they were in the process of letting go of the old covenant of God, and they were going wild. And Paul says, yeah, I also have the right to do anything. 
but I will not be mastered by anything. Meaning I won't be brought under the power of anything. I will not be ruled or held under authority by anything. I will make sure that every substance serves me instead of having to serve it. Once again, most of the things Paul lists here are not sinful in and of themselves. Sex, money, alcohol. What's problematic is when we find ourselves under their control instead of controlling them. I mean, he highlights a couple, sexual immorality, that is any sexual activity outside of a heterosexual marriage, drunkenness, being intoxicated with alcohol, or greed, equally bad, being intoxicated with money and what it can do for you. These are the common things that are looking to master, control us, and even worse, cause us to control and abuse those around us. A couple pages later, in the same letter, Paul repeats himself, I also, I have the right to do anything. That is clear. But not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. So the question when it comes to sex and money and power and all of these other things isn't how far can I go? How much can I have? The question is, how does my use of these things truly benefit me? How does it, better yet, how does it honor and benefit those around me? How does my use and practice, my engagement with sex, money, and power, all these things, how does my use of it benefit and expand the kingdom of God? Now, we, we can be particularly good at wiggling our way out of this stuff justifying ourselves. So one of the things we can do is we can ask our spouses or a good friend a few questions that will help us to be truthful. I included a few of those questions in this week's Grace Life email. If you don't get the Grace Life email, let us know. Call the church office and we'll get you set up. One of the questions I asked or I put in Grace Life this week, here's a question I dare you to ask someone who loves you. Is there anything in my life that looks like it's not under control? Ask someone who loves you, is there anything in my life that looks like it's not under control? Take a deep breath, listen to them, and then say, tell me more. Because <laughs> they have more to tell you. And it may not be the thing you thought they would say. So we're aware of the problems of addiction. Maybe we even know our specific temptations. We know we need self-control. What is the solution? How do we do it? Hebrews 4, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. My kids and I were talking about this guy. Who's the guy who uh, free summoned, free climbed? Alex, Alex what? Honnold. This guy, Alex Honnold. Is that right? Free soloed El Capitan in Yosemite. Every inch holding tight. Never getting slack and like, that's good enough, ah, you know. <laughs> Hold firmly, y'all, to Christ, to the faith, to the belief that he cares about you regardless of what you did this morning, last night, or on Tuesday. Hold, hold firmly. Don't give up. Don't let go. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness. But we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that 
we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You already know this, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you again, as a pastor, as someone who loves you, and as someone who, I have several people telling me these things too, you need to overcome that addiction. Whatever it is, workaholism, foodaholism, social media addiction, or meth. You know, whatever it is, you need to get free. Your family and your friends, they need you to do this. Your employer, your employees, your friends, people you will never meet, they're all gonna benefit as you get free. And they're all gonna benefit the moment you say yes. Not like 10 years from now, well, they'll benefit there too. They will benefit every time you say yes. And if you're anything like me, like I remember when I quit smoking cigarettes a long time ago, I said yes about 100,000 times until it finally stuck. Don't let the anyone, don't let the enemy or anyone else tell you you can't do it. But you are not gonna figure it out online or alone or in some nice self-help book. You've got to go to the throne of grace for help. Jesus has lived through the absolute worst of temptation. He gets it and he wants to help us. At the very beginning of his ministry, immediately after his baptism, Jesus went into the desert on a little retreat. How many of you remember this story in Luke chapter four? Jesus goes in the desert, little retreat. It's not the kind of retreat you would sign up for. It's not beautiful, there's no mountains, there's no beach, there's no worship music, there's no snacks. He goes into the wilderness, into the nowhere alone. And he fasts the whole time, eating nothing for six weeks. The Gospel of Luke tells a story in Luke 4, and it says he was tempted by the devil, not by desire, not by bad ideas, by the devil, tested by the devil himself. Well, we know it must have been a truly horrendous experience because Jesus, in his very short description on how to pray, says what? Deliver us from evil and lead us not into temptation. So here's Jesus alone, starving, and the only interaction he has with anyone other than the God the Father and the Spirit is the devil who won't leave him be. He's hungry, he's lonely, he's exhausted, he's hot and he's cold and he's likely irritated. I went for a hike by myself on Friday and the, the mosquitoes were enough to drive me nearly crazy. At this weakest point for Jesus, the devil throws his best at him. If you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread. That's addressing the temptation of appetite. Worship me and I will give you the kingdoms of this world. That's the temptation of ambition. If you are the son of God, prove it. Throw yourself off this temple and see if God rescues you. That's the temptation of affirmation, appetite, ambition, affirmation. And in every case, Jesus responds how? What does Jesus respond to the enemy with every single time? The word of God, the scriptures. That's a discipline. He had memorized them. He didn't have the Torah with him. Let's see, oh, what do I do now? Um... He had him so in his life, the moment the devil said something, he's like, ah, no, that's a lie. The scriptures, fasting, that's another thing he had been doing. It gave him clarity. He had been filled with the power of the spirit of God. He had intimacy with the father. Right after he had been baptized, the father says from heaven, this is my boy. I am so pleased with him. And that was ringing in his head every day the rest of his life. But there's one thing that we have, believe it or not, that Jesus didn't have on that retreat. Amazingly enough, that is this. 
the church, the community, each other. Together, we are the body of Christ for one another. For one another, you, you wouldn't have known this maybe, but the people standing with Jenny were the people in her small group. We are the ones who've experienced temptations of a thousand times. We are the ones who've failed a thousand more times, but also we're the ones who've overcome and our lives are radically different as a result. We face the same temptations Jesus faced. We face the temptations of appetite, ambition, affirmation, and we overcome them with the same things that Jesus did, with the scriptures, engaging the mind, with fasting as an expression of engaging the will. Intimacy with the Father, the more we know who the Father is, the more we know who we are. The power that can only come from the Holy Spirit living inside you and the community of the church. Our stories, Nathan, you wanna come up here? Our stories are these trophies of God's goodness, of God's power, of God's capacity to take whatever mess you've made of things and turn it into something absolutely incredible. This is Nathan Blackwell coming up here, one of my best friends. Nathan is married to Sarah who's our worship director. She was standing up here this morning. Together, Nathan and Sarah have four children, two in college and two in high school. Nathan is an elder here at Grace. He's a volunteer and sound team in 50 other ways. Nathan is a Virginia Tech grad, a civil engineer, a real estate entrepreneur. He enjoys a massive range of music, running a wide variety of equipment, and his favorite thing to do probably than other being with family and people anywhere is probably to mow grass. Nathan is one of the friendliest, most confident, most reliable and generous men you'll ever meet. So, I was talking to Nathan the other day. He calls me a lot just to say he loves me. And we were talking about this idea of sobriety and I asked him if he would share a little bit of his own story, and he said, I would be happy to. So here we go. Okay, go ahead, say whatever you want to say, Nathan. I just want to, is, it on? is, it working? is this working? Is it working yet? <laughs> It'll work. Sing sure. a little bit. That's it's right. helpful. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to, Growing up, I had a, a mess of college and drinking and different things like that. But I, and for years, just didn't have a settlement and peace. I knew God, but didn't have any, didn't have peace on the inside. So we do different things just to alcohol and just to settle it down. And um, Sarah and I went through a hard time 10 years ago where God loved me so much that he had to get stuff out. And that was probably the most wonderful gift that he's ever given me is pulling me out of a bad spot and making me start a journey, which was not fun to do, but it was the best thing that's ever happened to me. I mean, it's, it's blessed my family, it's blessed my marriage, it's blessed every, everybody around me. Things that I'm doing now, I would never have been able to do because I didn't have the internal uh, fortitude to, to handle it. Um, he had to build a good foundation for the things that he's given me. And without that, I wouldn't, I would have been a danger to everybody around me. So I'm still, breathing so I'm still growing and trying to just seek him in everything that I do but it's he's brought a peace that I never had before I started the, the journey and that was like 10 years ago but I've known God for much longer than that but that was the start of something different what what would you say was the um, 
real turning point for you? You know, I mean, because these are the kind of things, if anybody's ever struggled, I, I should never I'll take that from my vocabulary. <laughs> Since we all struggle yes. with these things, and we all know then that it's not a one and done thing a lot of times. We keep, you know, at some, we keep until we get breakthrough. Where did you get the biggest breakthrough? Well, I, on my journey, God always gives me opportunities to grow. And I can either listen to him and answer with a yes, or I'll say no and do it my own way. And then I know it's going to be more painful later to take that next opportunity to grow. So 10 years ago, I didn't want it, I didn't want it to be harder. I knew how it was already like really bad and it could have gotten worse and I didn't want it to. So I, I just surrendered and uh, just submitted myself to, to everybody around me to, to feed into me and to just asking God to help me in everything that I do. So what were some of the things that you put yourself into once you said yes, because that's the first step, right? So 10 years ago, you're like, I want out of this. I right. want to live differently. What were some of the things that helped you move forward and stay forward? The biggest thing is just being an open book, not hiding anything. I mean, just good, bad, and ugly. This is who I am. So getting friends that, that you can surround yourself with uh, submitting yourself to to people around you, just getting it to where you get that peace on the inside, and not and doing everything you can to preserve it. I mean, David talks about it, that in the Psalms. Once you yeah. get that peace, you don't want to lose that one. Yeah. So doing, I I like cutting grass. It's not cutting grass. I'm sitting there and listening to to <laughs> sermons or books or different things like yeah. that. The cutting grass is a means to to growing. Yeah, because people leave you alone. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you and Sarah just kind of did it yourself then with God. Oh. No, we um, we. And the Mahagans aren't here, but we, we submitted ourselves to, I submitted myself to the elders, to everybody that was in leadership above me. But we met with um, the Mahagans for, I think, like five years. Yeah. Once How a week. Often? Once, a, once week. a week for five years. Did you it's, catch that? Yeah. Once a week for five years. And being open and honest with them. And it's, just an act of love. I've never, I can't, I'll never get over that one in my life. But it's getting somebody that you can talk to and be open and honest with. Because we all have different hurts and pains and trauma that has happened in our lives. And it, the way to get rid of it is to just talk it out. To get it, get that junk out and to just expose it. And then it has no power over you. You know, as charismatics, that is people who believe that all the stuff that happened in the beginning of Acts can happen today. That's the easy definition, I would say, for charismatic Christians. Um, we sometimes think that if something doesn't happen instantly, it wasn't meant to be. And there is something about that initial breakthrough you get when you confess something, etc. But man, then there are the five years of talking to somebody for two hours every Thursday night that is what's necessary for the ongoing healing. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, like, what was it? What did he really do? That is what often happens to us. No, don't tell us. It doesn't even matter. It's not, that doesn't matter. What's important is the transformation that God does when the truth comes out from our mouth. You know, sometimes we get exposed and we're all terrified. What a great blessing. What a mercy of God that you can be exposed so that it doesn't have to stay in there anymore. Nathan's life is radically different than when I first knew him 15 years ago. He's not just a kind, gentle, friendly, reliable person. 
he's wildly successful. And that comes as a hint. Now God is like, okay, now you're a good steward of what I've given you. Boom. That's available to all of us. Um, Nathan, can you just pray for us this morning? And then we're almost done, y'all. Holy Spirit, thank you so much for everyone here. Thank you for every, every person that wants to grow. I pray that you bring life and life abundantly to every person who desires it and wants to have it, that is tired of just the same old, same old. I'll deal with this in a year or two. But let them know, each person, self-included, that you're with us, you're here to give us peace and comfort, that um, you want the best version of ourselves. I pray that um, you come speak to every soul here, that you just bring a new, just establish restoration in every person. I pray that um, you be with us the rest of the day. Protect us, mind, body, spirit, and soul. Just let us know how much you love us and show us new ways of who you are and who we are in, in, uh, as a result of knowing you more. That's good. Amen. Give, give Nathan a big round of applause, would you? All right. Now, I'm gonna give, I want to give you two minutes to reflect on what we've talking, talked about this morning. We're going to hold this space for a couple minutes. Don't think about your spouse or your friend or anybody else. At the end of Psalm 139, the psalmist says, Search me, O God. See if there's anything off and correct me. So I'm going to give you two minutes to allow God to search you. Think about your own life. And we're going to ask God to give you one thing that you can do today as a result of that. Just take, just take, uh, just take two minutes. We have the ministry team come forward. We're going to close our service here. And inevitably, there are um, more people that need to receive prayer than probably will say yes to it. But I really want to encourage you to come forward to receive prayer this morning or go and talk to someone today about whatever you experienced this morning or during that thing today, God, God wants to do something in you today. And there is an urgency here, y'all. There is an urgency. Friday, I was out back by um, Natural Chimneys on a hike and I saw this sign. I just, I have to show it. I will do it tomorrow is a disease that will kill your dreams. <laughs> Don't wait. Don't put it off any longer. God has incredible things. Could you all stand together with me? We're gonna close. God has incredible things planned for this church. 
He has incredible things planned for you. But in the same way I talked about that small engine that was kind of clogged up with ethanol, whatever, residue, sometimes I feel like the same thing is happening in my life and I know it's happening here in the church. I don't say it as some huge correction because I'm a part of the problem too, but I'm gonna do something about it because I, I wanna steward what God has given us really well here at this church. I don't want us to be like running at 50%. The things God has planned for us aren't gonna happen. We're not gonna see thousands saved, healed, and passionately following Jesus if our engine is clogged up. God, I thank you for your mercy. I thank you that we come to the throne of grace. We come to the throne of mercy. God, that when we come to you, you're not like, it's about time. You're like, I love you. Let's do it again. You never get tired. So God, I pray right now in this room that you would bring breakthrough right now. Whatever's going on in people's lives, wherever they're having a hard time managing or controlling or keeping these things down, God, would you bring your freedom and would you give us by your spirit very specific points of correction and ways out. You said you, you promised Whenever we were tempted, there'd be a way out. There'd be a lifeline. God, would you give us some lifelines today? And whatever else we need, God, would you empower your people for your purposes, for the glory of your kingdom? We love you and bless you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, come and get some prayer. Get somebody to talk to today. Otherwise, have a great week, and we'll see you Sunday.